So about 40 years ago, almost to this day, I was a graduate student at the Amos Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. And I was studying, starting to do a study about minority and women entrepreneurs and their connection to the community. I was much younger then. I was about 30 pounds lighter. I had a little afro, still Jeff, still had the hair back then. But I was a different, different person. But I began this study to look at what does it take for people of color and women to be successful as entrepreneurs in this economy. This is in 19, started 1982, 1982, almost 40 years ago. And from that research, my first book was published in 1994, and it was called Black Wealth. And there were a couple of things, there were a couple of findings that I uncovered in that, in that 10 plus year research, starting at Dartmouth. Number one, it tied into urban economic development. And what I concluded from the, from the research was that for cities like Baltimore, if you are going to address the issues of violence and crime and hopelessness and helplessness, you, your, your, your issue is an economic development issue. And no matter how many police you hire, no matter how many you put on the street, you are not going to get rid of this issue of crime, violence, hopelessness, and helplessness until you solve the economic equation. The second thing that I concluded in, in the study is the way that we changed that economic reality, that we had to accelerate. This is in 1982 through up through the 90s. We have to accelerate the formation of women and minority entrepreneurs. We had to find a way to accelerate that. Because when I was at, in business school at Dartmouth, we have all these speakers come in, and none of them look like most of you. We had Microsoft come in, and Lotus. Remember Lotus 1, 2, 3? You, I'm sure my age here a little bit, right? The founders of all those companies, right? The PC just came out from in 82, 83 time frame and all these entrepreneurs who did not look like most of you in this room. So we have to accelerate the formation of black and brown entrepreneurs. The third thing I said is the way that we need to accelerate that, that group expanding very rapidly, we had to remove the impediments. We had to remove the impediments. And what were they from my research? Three things. One, market access. Two, capital. Three, technical assistance. And if we could find a resource that could remove those pediments, or resources that could remove those pediments, we could, in fact, accelerate the formation of black and brown entrepreneurs. And so the last part was, well, what do we need to do? How do we need to, to make that happen? And, it was to, and the answer was to identify organizations like BCL. It was to recognize fine organizations like, like, like this organization and wrap our arms around them and provide them the resources that they need in order to meet the needs of those communities. Like many of you, I saw my friend Jeff. Jeff, raise your hand, Jeff. Jeff Hargrave and Arnold Williams and a couple other successful business entrepreneurs in here. Many of us have been blessed. We've been in business going on 30 years in IT and energy. We're about to launch a program that will train a thousand solar technicians and offshore wind technicians. And we're about to raise a quarter billion dollar fund to build community solar projects. I have been blessed. As many of you have been blessed. But one of the biggest blessings of being in business, and I think many of you who, here who are entrepreneurs can, can appreciate this, one of the biggest blessings is the customers that you, that you build a relationship with. And one of my favorite customers that I, I had was Toyota Motor Company, Toyota Motor Company. Now, why were they one of my favorite clients? One, because they were very smart. They are very smart people. And they were very good at problem solving. They had an engineering culture. There's an engineering culture in Toyota. And they have this process that they use, and it's called the five whys. 
the five wise. What does that mean? It means that when you have a problem and you're trying to dissect cause and effect of that problem, you ask five questions, why? For example, we have squeegee problem in Baltimore City. Some will say it's a problem, some say it's not, but let's say it's a challenge, right? So why are these young men out there in the street, you know, disrupting traffic? Why? Because they need money. Second why, well, why do they need money? Because they don't have a job. So why do they not have a job? Because they lack the education and the skills necessary to map to the existing jobs in our economy. So why do they not have the education and the skills? Because somehow along the way, they fell out of the education system. Why did they fall out of the education system? Maybe because their mom and daddy did not have the economic resources to support that family and to support them. Last year, I ran for mayor of Baltimore. Many of you know that, right? And one of the things that we did when looking at Baltimore, we said, let's take every single problem, challenge that Baltimore has, and let's apply the Toyota five whys to that situation. And we went through every single situation, and that's how we came up with our solutions that we were going to present to the city had I become mayor. But there were two things we found in almost every analysis of the five whys in Baltimore City. Where you get down, you say five, you, you ask the question five times, and you get down to the root cause. And there were two things that I saw, that we saw, two, two, two items that always popped up. Number one was lack of spiritual fortitude. And I'm gonna come back to that one. It's getting real quiet in here now. I didn't get any amens on that. And the other one was lack of economic opportunity. In almost every problem that we assessed with the five whys, it concluded almost one by one, lack of spiritual fortitude and lack of economic resources and opportunity. Now you ask, what do you mean by spiritual fortitude? I'm not talking about religion here, folks, although that will preach. And maybe one day, Madam President, I'll come back and preach it, but I ain't gonna preach it tonight, okay? What I'm talking about when I say spiritual fortitude, it is an understanding, it is a belief that if I do, if I keep trying and I keep working, that, that, what my, that, that my efforts that I do today will lead to a better tomorrow. It is the belief that if I do that, that my tomorrow will be better than my today. It's what you call, might call hope. And a man or woman who doesn't have hope is a dead woman or a dead man. They're the walking dead. Hope, lack of hope. But the second one was economic opportunity. And I come back to BCL in terms of providing what is necessary, in terms of economic opportunity to help our community to close that gap. I do not need to say any more. You heard it from these two brothers. You heard it right from the horse's mouth. You heard that this organization, if it wasn't for BCL, they may not be in business today. And how many other young women and young men are in that same condition, that same point today? So thus, BCL is to, can step up and provide that, kind, that gap that is so necessary and so needed. And so as we look at our city and we look at what has to happen, I assure you from our analysis that it all comes down to economic opportunity and economic potential. Now, I know you all sitting there wondering, well, Bob, I've got a whole lot of other commitments that I'm responsible for. Yeah, I do as well. But let me share this, this story with you, because sometimes people, they, 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 they make an excuse about why they don't get involved, why they don't provide their resources, why they don't want to make a commitment. And I'm reminded of a story a couple years ago I was invited by the governor, a couple of us, to go on a trade mission, a trade mission to Africa. And we had identified certain countries, Liberia was one of them, Madam President, which Madam President, is, her, her roots are in Liberia. 
South Africa was, was another country. And we looked at those some things in Botswana and Mozambique. But I was assigned to South Africa. And particularly, I was, I was assigned to Cape Town. Anyone here ever been to Cape Town? That's a couple of you have. Right. Very nice city, right? Well, there's an island across the water from Cape Town. It's called Robin Island. Do you know what Robin Island? Many of you do. Robin Island was where they kept Mandela and the other political prisoners during that terrible time in South Africa. So I was able to, by God's grace, to bring my wife and my children, because we had done a lot of mission work in Africa already. And so we were there, you know, in, 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 in South Africa and, and touring. And my daughter here was with us, and she was much younger then. Raise your hand, Taylor. This, this is my only daughter, right? <laughs> Don't raise your hand then, Taylor, right? <laughs> so we were there, and so I had a big meeting that night with some South African business people in Cape Town. So we had the whole day free. So what we decided to do was to, to get some tickets and take my family to Robin Island to tour the island to see the conditions that Nelson Mandela and the other political prisoners of that country had to endure. We spent the whole day, my wife and my children, on Robin Island. And we saw the cell, when, with the six by six foot cell that Nelson Mandela had to spend 18 years of his 27 years imprisonment. He spent 18 years on Robin Island. And we saw the lime pit where he had to, where they were forced to break limestone and then how it caused damage to his eyes, which in later years he could hardly see. And he talked about, and we saw the, 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 the torture that these men went through, and women went through on Robin Island. So you can imagine, by the end of the day, we get back on the boat and go back to Cape Town, and I've got this meeting with the South African business people in Cape Town. So I do my best to get showered and get dressed, and I go to the restaurant to meet these South African business people. And my wife, before I left for the, for the restaurant, my wife, she, if you ever meet my wife, you, you'll know who the brains is in our family and the good looks, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? She always tells me, honey, I know how you are. She says, do not talk about religion and don't talk about politics. If you stay away from those two, you'll be fine. So I listened to my wife, like any good husband would do, and I go to the meeting. And so we're having dinner with these, with these South African business people, and I am churning inside. And but, beloved, I did my best. I, 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 I really, I mean, I went to the bathroom to pray a little bit, you know. Okay, okay Lord, give me the strength, give me strength. But I came back to the table, and I just couldn't help myself. And I had to ask the question, did you not know what was happening on Robin Island? Did you not know that they had taken your fellow countrymen and they were torturing them on this island? Did you not know that, they, that Nelson Mandela spent 18 years of hard labor and terror by your government, did you not know? And they looked at me. Some of them were a little embarrassed. And what do you think they said? They said, no, we did not know to a person. No, Bob, we did not know. We know from human history that there are moments in time when things are happening that are wrong, when, when it's time for us to stand up and be counted and do something. I'm reminded of the story in World War II when, when, when Hitler had, had tried to exterminate the Jewish people and they went to the German people after the war and they asked them the same question that I asked those white South Africans, did you not know? And they also said, we did not know. So beloved, tonight, 
we have an opportunity to make a difference in Baltimore City. We have an opportunity tonight to wrap our arms around this organization because I don't want you to leave here saying you did not know. I don't want you saying, Bob, I did not know that Baltimore is in the red zone where red lights are flashing in our city, meaning there's something wrong and that we who care have to stand up and be counted. I don't want you to leave here tonight saying, I did not know that there's a correlation between economic opportunity and social dysfunction. I don't want you to leave here tonight saying, I did not know that if I don't have find a way or help a way or create a way to accelerate the growth of, of, of minority businesses and entrepreneurs, don't leave here tonight saying, I did not know that if I don't help this organization by bringing in prayers, by bringing in your money, by bringing in your ideas and your innovation, that we can change this city. Because as I said at the outset of my, of my comments, if you get to the root problem in Baltimore City, it is the lack of economic opportunity, especially for African Americans and people of color. Tonight we have an opportunity to make a difference, as these two brothers showed us. Let us expand that resource, expand that opportunity to touch as many people as we can, and we need your help, and we need it now. So if you came here tonight and you did not know, now you know. <laughs>